Good morning, Weems Creek family. It's great to see you this morning, and we're excited to start worshiping with you. We've got a great service ahead of us. So if you would, let's begin this morning by singing, Oh, Four Thousand Tongues to Sing.
name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. have had a lot of challenges, obviously, and, you know, it's important that when we have these challenges that we turn to the Lord for our support. We thought it would be great this morning if we shared one of those stories from our congregation. Scott and Pam Hill did an interview earlier this week with Pastor Orr, and we're going to share how they're relying on the Lord during this challenging time, so take a peek at this video. Well, we're here with uh, Scott and Pam Hill, and um, their, their story, their most recent story and part of their testimony actually begins uh, before the coronavirus hit. And so I want you to just start out by sharing a little bit of uh, what's going on in your life and, and, and the biggest news here recently, okay? Okay. Um, as of February 14th, that was uh, kind of when this roller coaster started. Pam's been real sick for about a year now, uh, having a lot of uh, digestive troubles and things like that but uh, we finally uh, got some definitive uh, testing done on February 14th and uh, it wasn't exactly what we wanted to hear or expected to hear but uh, the doctor came in and told her that she had pancreatic cancer and that he was pretty certain of it and he would have to go through a few more tests and things to to be sure but uh, he had seen enough of it before to know, and so uh, it was really scary, and we didn't have a lot to go on but that, and we knew that we would have to have a whole lot more testing and things like that done, and so um, we asked for a lot of people to start praying for us at that time, praying for Pam, and uh, praying specifically that uh, uh the further testing that would be done that we would get some uh, good news from that and uh, uh, it was just amazing to uh, see everybody's response to uh, the prayer request how about the um, as you enter into this phase with the coronavirus kind of upsetting the apple cart on everything has that affected your treatment or your connections with the doctors and the hospital it actually has. Um, I had an infection a few days ago and ended up at the emergency room. And the first thing they said was, Scott can't go in with me. So he ended up uh, sitting in the parking lot for four or five hours waiting on me for a diagnosis and treatment and to see whether or not they would keep me. Um, and, you know, it, it just made me realize that the world is different right now. So, um, while we were excited that they were taking care of my needs and everything. And we totally respected the fact that they wanted to keep other people safe. Uh, it just, it just made us realize how different things were because he couldn't be there with me. He had to sit in the parking lot and wait. Well, I know that this was a joke to both of you. I, I think it'd be hard to hear that news at any point, but tell us a little bit about how has the Lord worked in your life? Uh, since that diagnosis? You know, it, it really was shocking um, when he first came out and talked to us, but I think we both had an immediate peace that, you know, we knew people were already praying for us as we went in for this procedure. And I had been doing a little research and reading and Scott had as well. And, and so we were kind of expecting to say that we might have chron chronic pancreatitis or some things like that from, you know, the past month's experience. But um, 
we just felt an instant peace that even though it was not a good diagnosis, that um, God immediately said, I'm not finished. And, you know, um, so many scriptures started coming to mind uh, instantly that calmed us and just gave us hope that um, even though we didn't understand what was going on, that God had planned this way before I was born and he already knew what um, what was taking place and that we could go with confidence that, you know, even though we were going to be hit with a lot of new information that he already was aware of that. And that just, it gives you an incredible amount of peace to know that nothing catches him off guard. So what's been the hardest part of this? Um, probably maybe our children and grandchildren being so far away, they felt the isolation as much as anything with the virus. Um, one of our sons had scheduled a trip to come out immediately and be here with us. And of course needed to cancel that, not only to protect me and not bring germs into our home, but, um, but also just to protect himself traveling cross country. And of course now that would not be possible anyway, but um, just that they feel the distance and, you know, um, they're, they're often in, in three other states uh, far away from here. So, the virus has changed a lot of those things as far as just how we could normally be together as a family. And um, so that distance has, has been one of the things we've felt. But, you know, God's also provided such a great church family and fa uh, friends helped us, you know, get established in this area enough that we felt a lot of love and support that's made up for that distance. So um, it's, it's just amazing how he goes before us. So, Amen. Scott, tell me, how has the Lord worked in, in your life? You're in a different place. You're the caregiver, and you're the one trying to support her as she gets through some of the pain and the discomfort and some of the things that come with it. How has the Lord worked in your life through this? Well, he's just comforted me in a lot of ways, and, and it's just been amazing, the outpouring of uh, letters and cards that have been sent to Pam with encouragement and scripture and just some of the daily scripture that we get from people, you know, even electronically and, and through the mail and different ways uh, has just encouraged us, you know, and, and it encourages me to be able to take care of her. It's been challenging. Uh, there's a lot of new ways to learn to do things. Uh, you know, getting simple things like groceries has been uh, a real challenge. And, and so I'm sure everybody's going through a lot of that right now, but uh, yeah, God's encouraged me all along the way, but uh, mostly with the way that uh, we've seen the outpouring of love and, and care towards Pam and, and uh, just the, the people reaching out to her and providing her with daily passages of scripture and, uh, encouragement, encouraging words, and just uh, just hope in the midst of all of this. Amen. Those words from God become much more real when, when we're in that desperate place. And we Absolutely. need Him. And, well, we appreciate so much your willingness to share with us today, and pray that it'll be encouraging. I know it will be encouragement to the, the whole larger family that's listening today. So thank you, and we will uh, we will check in with you soon. Okay. No thank you. Good. Thank good you. Deal. It's always encouraging to be able to hear how our brothers and sisters are still trusting in the Lord. If you'd pray with me now. Lord, we know that you have arranged things from the beginning of time, and we know that we are part of your plan, the things that happen to us, the things that you allow us to do. And we know that during this time, it's important that not only do we have to say that we know you have it under control, but we need you. Because when we say that we need you, we're admitting that we do not have enough on our own and that you are the one who completes us and gives us the ability to complete your purposes as well. Lord, may that be our prayer this morning, that we need you, and that we know that you are available to us because you say that you are. In Jesus' name, amen.
You're the one that guides my heart. And Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I Is Christ in me? comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you and Jesus you're my hope and stay Jesus you're my hope and stay of what we're about to celebrate this coming week. Not only did he die on the cross, but he rose again. And today we praise his name because of the salvation that he has given each of us. All we have to do is ask and accept the gift that is out there for us. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. And oh, praise the name of the Lord.
sharing with you some videos of our home missionaries and this month throughout Easter we take up a special offering called the Annie Armstrong offering and you know even though there's a standstill to much of life the need to share salvation to share who Jesus is is stronger than ever and we just want to share some of the work that's being done through these videos my name is Kirk Kirkland and this is the story the hardest thing my family and I ever attempted. Uh, we were crazy enough to leave everything to move to Cincinnati to plant a church. My wife was nine months pregnant. We just had enough money to kind of pay the rent and survive and put food on the table. We only had just a few pieces of furniture. I remember we had a dining room table, a bed, and just somewhere to lay our, our child. We did not know one person who lived in the city. We didn't have a denomination. We didn't have a network behind us. We were very much on an island, but we were so compelled that we were um, following Jesus. And we advertised for our first service on uh, Easter of 2013, and 66 people from the city showed up on that very first day. I got counsel from another pastor who had made a similar journey. And he says, have you ever heard of North American Mission Board and support what you're doing? You're planting multiple churches. So we re-looked at what it meant to be to be a missionary. We realized that we didn't have to do it alone. And so we voted to plant another church and to join the Southern Baptist Convention. We said that let's do this again. What we've seen God do, God can do it again in the suburbs. And so we committed to planting the second church. Now we're a part of a wider community and family, and we know that we're better together. Um, the training that we've received is the way that we plant churches. When you give to missions, we plant the next church. We go to the next town. We go to the next village. And when you give, lives are changed, plain and simple. It's good to see you this morning. Well, I can't see you, but it's good that you're there, and I know that you're there, and so I'm glad you're with us this morning. 
I think one of the most affirming things that we can experience in our life in a time of deep need is when someone prays for us by name in the power of the Spirit of God. And that is such an affirming thing. And I would, I would encourage husbands and wives from time to time, if not regularly, once a, a, at the evening before you go to bed, to just pray for each other. It's a very affirming thing when somebody that you know and love and who walks with God prays for you and calls you out by name before the throne of grace. And that's what Jesus is doing for his disciples on this occasion. Jesus has just told the disciples, he said, look, I've told you all these things and I've done it for a purpose so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And then the Bible says this, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and he prayed. And he began what's known as the high priestly prayer for his disciples, but also for future disciples. And that's where I'm going to concentrate our focus this morning. He began to pray, Father, the hour has come. He knows that the cross, which has been before him, is now staring him in the face. The hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Some think of that section, the first five verses, as Jesus praying for himself. But he's not praying for his, himself for his own ends, but that the Father might be glorified and that he might accomplish the Father's will on the cross, which we know that he did. But before we enter the heart of the message this morning, I want us to look at the definition of eternal life that Jesus gives in chapter 17, verse 3, in this prayer. He says this, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life, Jesus says, that they know you, the only true God. Now, when we think of eternal life, we think of a lot of different things, don't we? We think of a duration for all of eternity in the presence of God, and it does include that idea. But Jesus says the heart of the gift of life, eternal life, is the knowledge of God, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And that's going to become a common refrain through this prayer. That people should not only know the Father, but Jesus the Son whom the Father has sent. And so as we enter into this prayer where Jesus is praying for his own, in verses 6 through 19, Jesus concentrates his prayer on the disciples who are in the room for him, or with him. And he knows that they are facing turbulent days. Man, the winds of adversity are going to blow in their face before the night is over. And he prays for them, and he prays that God will, he's not asking the Father to take them out of the world, but he's praying that the Father will protect them, that they will be set apart by the truth of God, for the glory of God, that he might watch over and protect them, that they might be in this world but not of this world, and that God, by the power of his name, would continue to work in their lives. But I want us to focus our attention this morning on his prayer for us. You see, in verses 20 through 26, as Jesus moves to conclude the prayer, he says in verse 20, he says, my prayer is not for them alone, meaning the disciples who are in the room and the role they will play in the building of the kingdom. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. You see, Jesus is play, praying for the generations to come. Those who will hear the gospel through the preaching and the teaching of the apostles and then in turn they will continue to share the gospel, and generation after generation, 
God will build his kingdom. God will build his church through the message of Jesus Christ. And that as people come to faith in Christ, he will continue to build that message. And we are a part of this stream of history of the church of Jesus. And so on this occasion, Jesus is praying for you and for me. And so I want us to take note today of how he prayed on this final night, how he prayed for us. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message, and I'm going to read through verse 23, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me. Now, you see, Jesus considered it glory to come as a suffering servant, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus considered humble service as to be his glory, and he wants us to do the same. And he says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So in his final earthly prayer, Jesus made unity his transcending concern. And he is explicit about the nature of this unity. The unity for which he prays is to lead to a fuller experience of the Father and the Son. Listen to his words here. That all of them, this is verse 21a, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Verse 22b, that they may be one as we are one. Verse 23a, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Now, when Jesus said that this is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God, he's anticipating that which is to come. He's envisioning that same unity and love that exists in the Father and in the Son and in the Son fulfilling the purpose of the Father. By going to the cross, Jesus dying on that cross as a sacrifice for our sins, Him atoning for our sins there. And then the promise of the coming of the Spirit and Him indwelling us by His Spirit, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, indwelling our body through the person of the Spirit, and how He is going to continue to build faith in our lives. And He says, this is eternal life, that they know you, Father, that they know you, and Jesus Christ, your Son, the only true God. That's who He's talking about. And He's talking about something that God is going to do in our life that which he foresees happening in the lives of his disciples for generation after generation after generation after generation. And he sees God stirring in the hearts of his people. And eternal life is much more than just having a promise that we will live forever in heaven. It is a continuous, developing, growing relationship with the Lord God, the one true God for all of eternity. And to know him, that is life. That is the life that God wants to stir in our soul. And so I would ask you today, you see, that is what drew me to Christ. Ultimately, I was born and raised in the church. But when I heard testimonies one evening, and I heard several, one after the other, the thing that stirred my heart was they were talking about a relationship with Jesus, and I knew that I did not have it. I knew that they had something that I did not have. And later that night, I gave my heart over to Christ after hearing the gospel that night. Now, I would ask you today, Jesus says eternal life is more than just a pathway to heaven. It's more than just knowing that Jesus is the way to God. It's knowing God himself and the inner witness of the Spirit of God working and stirring in your heart. And that's what he's praying for his church here. 
He said, my prayer is not only for these disciples, although, although I pray this for them too, but I pray for those who will yet believe that all of them may be one, that there might be such a stirring, such a joy, such a peace, such a love that develops in the heart of those who believe and trust that their hearts will be knit together. You see, Christ prays for a supernatural unity, one that is modeled and enabled by the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. And this unity is possible because true believers are united in the core of their being. You know, there's something distinctive about that witness of Christ in our life. I'm sure that many of you have experienced this before where you're in a setting where you're getting to know people for the first time or you're meeting people that you have not previously known and you know nothing about them. And yet as you interact with people, we often begin to sense that we have met another believer even before words have been spoken to that effect. You see, we share a kinship. We sense a commonality in them. We sense a a work of God's Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit in their life. And we sense in them something that, and it's because we share a kinship with them in Jesus Christ who indwells us and the Spirit of God indwells us. And we sense and we understand because the indwelling of God's nature and the Holy Spirit in us. You see, the Bible says this in Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. For in Christ... All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. But he's saying that not only does the fullness of the deity live in bodily form in Jesus, he's saying that in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He's saying that there's a richness of spiritual life God life, divine life that he has planted within our soul. And he's saying to us that because of that, we are drawn to one another. And the closer we draw to Christ, the closer we draw to one another. The closer we draw to Christ, one of the manifestations of it is that we are drawn near to one another and that we are with one another and that we want to be supportive and, and working with people for the glory of God. You see, that's the nature of the Christian life. John said this in his brief letter that we know as 1 John. He said in the very introduction, in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 1, we proclaim to you what we have heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. He says, when we invite people to Jesus Christ, we invite them into a fellowship with us. We invite them into a relationship with us. They become a part of the family of God. And he calls on us to, to be a people who, who share that love and that, that nature that God gives. You see, Christian unity is supernatural because it comes from God's nature. And it's experienced in its fullness as we draw close to him, that they may be one as we are one. You see, that's important, that God's Spirit. Have you ever been a part of something where you are working together, and you are working together for the kingdom of God, and, and you are drawn together in just a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with people who have the same purpose, the, the same goal in mind? It's a beautiful thing, and God has a way of working in people's lives through those experiences. God wants us to be one. Now, in God's mind, unity does not mean uniformity. You see, just imagine with me for a moment that we could bring together some of the great Christians down through the centuries. From the fourth century, we might bring the great intellect Augustine from the 10th century, the devotional man Bernard of Clairvaux. From the 16th century, John Calvin, the great theologian. From the 17th century, John Wesley and George Whitfield, who were the flaming evangelists that shook two continents for God 
in Europe and Britain and over here in America as well. And then in the 19th century, Charles Haddon Spurgeon and D.L. Moody from the 20th century, Billy Graham. And if you could just get all these Christians together, we think of what a wonderful thing it would be, but there would be so many things that you could not even get a unanimous vote on. They would be different. Their styles would be different. They would be from different eras. They would have different expectations and different experiences in, in life. But underneath it all would be a common love for Jesus Christ and a unified heart and a heart for God that would hold them together and glue them together. You know, Christ's prayer for unity does not mean that we should all be the same. Sometimes this can be a real source of trouble in relationships. Too many, uh, too many uh, believers think other believers should be just like them. Perhaps they should carry the same Bible or read the same books, promote the same styles of dress, etc., educate their children in the same way, have the same likes and dislikes. You see, that's uniformity. That's not unity. And we're not called just to to all be exactly the same on all of those things. The insistence that others be just like us is one of the more divisive things and forces that can be a part of a local church. But God recognizes diversity. He creates us in a diverse way. And this is implicit in Paul's teaching on spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, we read the following. Now, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. You see, God has a way of, of using different people with different likes and dislikes and different strengths and talents and abilities and spiritual gifting. And he brings us all together in the family of God. Let me ask you this. Does it take more maturity for a bunch of people to work together on something and really stay unified and work together? Or is it easier for a person to just go their own way and do their own thing and be by themselves and not have to mess with all those other people? It takes a lot more maturity to get things done, and that's how God envisions the body of Christ. Different people coming together with different gifts and different personalities and different likes and dislikes, and all of them being bound together by a common love for Jesus Christ. And his message, his prayer, is that we, they would be one. And it's important to the life of the church. It's important to the witness of Christ. You see, he says why it is so important. There in chapter uh, 17, verse 20, he says, Those who will believe in, I pray also for those who will believe in me through the message that all of them may be one. And then at the end of verse 21, he says, um, May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 23, so that they may be brought com to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. You see, the Bible talks about this kind of unity that stirs the life of God's church, stirs us. You know, it's more, though, than just getting along. What binds us together is the joy of Jesus. What binds us together is a common commitment to Christ and to living the Christ life. And that's what he calls us to. You see, he wants to love through us. And he wants to get that message out. And so this fellowship, this unity, is to be centered on the Word of God and our allegiance to the teaching of the apostles and the New Testament and how God works in our lives. And so he calls us to be a people. And that's Christ's prayer for his church. And he calls us to be a people who, who work together. We see this unity and how it expresses itself in many areas of life. You can see it at work. I can remember one time when we were 
as a teenager when we were replacing the brick in a lime kill in a paper mill. And we had to take out all this brick that had lime all over it. And if it got on your skin, it would bubble up and all that kind of thing. And so you had all this protective stuff on. And so we got it all out. And then we had to put the new brick in. And I was not a bricklayer. I was a grunt worker. I was just taking a wheelbarrow and, and taking stuff to the men who were doing it. But we had a system that we developed with about 20 guys that were doing this all at once. And man, I mean, as everybody worked together, it was amazing. It was amazing how the thing just went. Nobody wanted to take a break because they were in the flow and the work was going so strong. And then we ended up getting through about four hours early and we were able to go home four hours early and yet they paid us for the whole thing. And it was a great, it was a great job experience between semesters in college. But you see, we see it in many areas of life. When people are in sync, and it starts from within, though, as a Christian, that we care about the mission of Jesus, that Jesus is praying for his disciples here. And I want us to look at his prayer, his desire for the church in verse 24. His desire for the church in verse 24. Jesus says this. He says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Jesus is about to end his prayer. He's ready to take the disciples to the Mount of Olives. And there he's going to be arrested. And he knows what's coming. And he's praying for these, and he's prayed that God would keep them safe, that he would protect them, that he would keep them faithful, that they would be set apart to God's purpose by his truth, by his teaching, and all that he has left with them, by the ministry of the Spirit in them, by the fellowship that they have with Christ and the Father, and will have with the Holy Spirit. And he says to them, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. And he's praying this for you and me as well. I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. And to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Jesus is thinking, I'm going to go the way of the cross. I'm going to be resurrected. Things are not going to be the same. And I am going to ascend back to the Father because that's what's best for the disciples. And I'm going to pour out the Holy Spirit. And things are not going to be the same. But he's saying, Father, I've already told them I'm going to prepare a place for them. But he says, I want to pray. I want to let you know that it's deep in my heart, and I know we're together in this. I want them to be where I am. And, Lord, they have observed me. They have gotten a taste of my glory. They have gotten a taste of what it is to know God. They have gotten a taste of what it is. But, Lord, I want them to see my heavenly home. I want them to see Father, Spirit, and Son together working I want them to behold the glory of God. And that's something he wants for us. That's something he wants for you. He wants you to be where he is. And he wants you to behold his glory. Do you not look forward to that day? God's given us a mission. On this earth. And sometimes some of the glorious moments are even in some of the hardest moments. But Jesus is, in, is envisioning the day when they will be with him, when we will be with him, and we will be able to see the fullness of his glory. Jesus was willing to divest himself of that glory for a season while he came to this earth. But as he ascends to the Father, he knows that he will retain it. 
And Jesus is going to be there to us to say, welcome home. Welcome home. And we are going to arrive at the home we have always longed for, and we will find that we really have never wanted anything else than that. God stirs desires within us. There is mystery there, but there is the witness so strong in our hearts of the Holy Spirit saying that we need to follow Christ, and that in Christ there is life. And that in the Son, we know the Father. And that in the Son and the Father, we know the Spirit. And you see, there's a different kind of life that we come to as we spend time in the Word of God, that we might know the person of God, because that's eternal life. If you have been born into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ and your sins have been forgiven and the Spirit of God has in dwelt you, you already have eternal life. And that life is the life with God and knowing Him. But then He gives a promise. He gives a vow to the Father, and He gives a promise to His church in verses 25 and 26. Jesus says, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. Jesus knows the Father. Jesus and the Father are one. He says, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. My disciples know that you have sent me. They have testified to their faith. They know that I have come from God, that I am returning to you, Father. He says in verse 26, I have made you known to them. But this is the vow that he makes. I have made you known to them, and I will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. To those disciples who were in the upper room that night, he says, I've made you known to them. But to all of us who would come after the fact, Jesus says, I will continue to make you known. I will continue to reveal you to my disciples. I will continue to reveal your goodness, your faithfulness, your love, your watch care over our lives. I will continue to show them that. We must follow. We must be the kind of disciple that wants to fulfill the vision of Jesus. They would be his witnesses. They would face the hostility of the world. They would be faithful to the gospel. They would be the ones who would go in Jesus' name to the ends of the earth. And he says, every step of the way, I will continue to make you known. Why? In order that the love you have for me may be in them. That the love of the Father, that the love He has for Jesus the Son will be in us. And He's wanting to cultivate a, a love in us, a love for the Father, a love for the Son, a love for the Holy Spirit, a love for one another, a love that drives us together a love that truly loves Christ and is committed to His Word, to the nurture of faith. You see, Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 21, this has kind of become a life verse to me that I discovered many decades ago, soon after becoming a Christian. In John chapter 14, verse 21, I highlighted it, didn't really spend a lot of time on it. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. You see, Jesus said, to know me is to know the Father. 
And Jesus says, I have a commitment. I have made a vow to the Father. I have made a promise to the church. I will continue to make you known, Father, that the love of God can be poured out and evidenced in their soul and in their life. And that's what he's calling you and me to. What is our duty as a disciple? Do you want to be an, an answered prayer for Jesus? Do you want to be part of the answer to this prayer of Jesus? Then we need to draw near to Christ. We need to feed on his word. We need to, in humility, serve one another. And in doing so, we become a part of the answer to this prayer of Jesus. He makes a promise, and Jesus keeps his promises. And he never lets us down. He never lets us down. And our prayer today needs to be that we will be that kind of disciple, that we don't want to let Jesus down. We want to grow in him. We want to be a part of God's church. We want to be a part of his army. That's another of the metaphors that the Bible uses for the people of God, that we are soldiers in the army of Jesus on a mission of love, to conquer in love with the power of the gospel, with the Jesus who saves, and the power of the Spirit who gives power to our witness. You see, God is the one who converts the soul. God is the one who changes lives. But he calls upon us to live out the kind of love that he has for us and that we participate in through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so I would ask you today, Christian, are you one of the disciples who is truly an answer to this prayer? You want to draw near to Christ. You want to feed on his word. You want in humility serve one another. You want to be a part of the active body of Christ and the family of God. And that's what we need to be. And that's what Jesus is praying for. As he prays for his disciples, is one last time, that's the burden of his heart for those who will come to faith ultimately. That we might be one. That one day he will have us with him and that we can see his glory. And then that he's going to continue to show himself and to show the Father to us. Christ prayed for us that night. And then he went out and he was brutalized. Jesus left this glowing moment. He left these several hours with the disciples. In John chapter 12, he's, he testifies to his heart being troubled because of what was coming. He made his way through what the disciples needed in those next several hours. But then it was time, and he made his way to the Mount of Olives, and there he was arrested. And what he went through on the cross for you and for me was an act of love. It's the supreme act of a demonstration of the love of God for you and me and the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one, on, one and only son. And he put him on the cross to die for our sins. That's the love of God. And he calls upon us to live in that love. To live as one. And to live as committed disciples in answer to this prayer of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that Jesus loves us so. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are so committed to not only indwelling us, to not only giving us assurance of a permanent life with you, but, Lord, that you have promised that you will continue to show us the Father, that you will continue to show us your goodness, your faithfulness, your joy, your peace. Lord, teach us self-control. 
Teach us to act in righteousness. Teach us to talk to our Father on a regular basis. Teach us to live together as the church of Jesus in ways that make a difference in people's lives. And Lord, we thank you that you are stirring something in our life that is available to us, a different kind of life. Lord, help us to know you, to know your power, to know your strength, and to, Lord, be committed to your mission to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We appreciate so much your being with us today. I do want to mention right quick that uh, we will not be able to have our Good Friday service this Friday that we normally do, but we are going to prepare a video, a devotional uh, concerning the cross, the crucifixion that took place on Good Friday, and what it means to us that we pray will really enhance your experience of the Easter season as you think of the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, that'll, we hope to get that out Thursday night, but at the latest, uh, first thing Friday morning. Now, the other thing I want us to do right now is Governor Hogan has declared this time, 12 noon, a time of prayer for all Marylanders to pray to the Lord God and that he would uh, just bring his blessing in the whole fight against this virus that is plaguing not only our nation, but the world at this time. And so we want to join with other believers all over this state right now in this moment, and we are going to pray for God's healing touch to be upon this people in this world. Let's pray together right now. Father, we know that you care. We know that you love this world, not only believers, but unbelievers. You loved them enough that you gave your son. That he died on that cross, not only for, for our sins, but for the sins of the world. And Lord, we know that you acted in love then, that you are acting in love today, that you always do right. And Lord, we know that we can trust you. You Encourage us to cast all our cares upon you because you do care for us. And so we come to you, Lord, and we want to present our request to you today. And Lord, we pray that you would lead researchers to an answer for this disease. We pray, God, that you would solidify a work and a vaccine that works, that is effective, that will silence the voice of this virus and days to come. We pray, God, for those who are in the hospital, those who are in desperate need of treatment. Lord, we pray that you would bless them. We pray, God, that you would enable their bodies to fight against this disease. We pray, Lord, that you would be with the health care workers, the doctors and the nurses and all those who attend to them. We pray that you would protect them from this virus. We pray that you would help them and give them wisdom and insight into each individual person, Lord, how they can serve them while they are in that hospital. Lord, we pray that you would just help bring the, the stoppage of the spread of this virus. We pray that you would put it in people's hearts to practice wisdom in the way that they relate to one another and to love their neighbor by being willing to cooperate with the authorities. We pray, Lord, that you would guide those who are in charge. The, uh, Lord, we pray for the president and his task force. We pray for our leaders in the Senate and the House. We pray, Lord, for our state leaders, our governor, and all those who work with him, and all those who provide counsel to him. We pray, Lord, that you would give wisdom and that you would give grace to each one. Lord, I pray that you would unite us in a people in opposition to this virus and, Lord, for the preservation of life. And we pray, God, that you would minister to the needs of every person. Lord, we love you. We thank you that we can serve you. And we pray that you would find those ways for our church. We're the people of God. Lord, we spread out in this community, and we pray, God, that we can find ways to help encourage and bless and bring help to this whole situation. Please, Lord, 
do what only you can do. And Lord, in the process, we pray that you would lead many to faith in Christ. That you would lead many to recognize their need for Jesus. And that you would lead many to turn in faith to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Church, thank you for joining with us today, for joining in that prayer. That was not just my prayer. That was us praying together and with believers all over the state. So we just ask you to uh, stay safe, to stay healthy, uh, to stay in touch. And we will look forward to seeing you as soon as we can. Thank you.